Hey there, and welcome to You Talk. We highlight stories from across Canada, the diverse cultures and communities living here, and organizations and individuals that help make life the best it can be. I'm your host, Brian Funk. August 6th to 8th, Folklorama Fusion, the one unified virtual experience, is taking place. The one multicultural fusion event is the first time the ethnocultural member communities that make up the pavilions will virtually showcase their heritage. Here's Executive Director Teresa to tell us more about this virtual festival and the history of Folklorama. Thank you for having me, Ryan. Uh, so, Teresa uh, Catronio, I'm the Executive Director here at Folklorama and uh, have been in this particular role for uh, three years. And previous to that was actually the director of uh, member and festival services. So I oversaw the execution of the festival um, itself. Oh, that's super exciting. Yeah, how, how was your experience? What, how have you, you know, enjoyed uh, being a part of Folklorama? Well, it's actually, you know what, it, it's surreal. Uh, it's been part of my life. Uh, since I was 12 years old. Mm -hmm. um, I was literally, you know, uh, involved right from the get-go, first as a performer at one of the pavilions, and then uh, as a volunteer through the years, and then all of a sudden found myself on the corporate side, uh, just based on, you know, <laughs> my actual professional experience, it all came, it all came full circle. So um, it's definitely more than a job, definitely a passion project for me, and um, I'm feel blessed to be part of this organization. Yeah, that just seems to be the thing. You find something that you're passionate about and the next thing you know, you're working there. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and, it's, and it's awesome too, right? It's, it's, uh, it makes it extra special. Yeah, and now that I'm living in Winnipeg, I can't wait to uh, you know check the festival out and just all the festivals in Winnipeg. It's something, uh, especially with COVID, uh, have been able to check out and now, you know, now I'm ready to just get out there and experience everything. Yeah. So, so how about, you know, for those who are unaware, what is Folklorama? Well, um, I, I'm probably not going to find many people who don't know what Folklorama is, <laughs> uh, but uh, for the sake of those who don't, uh, so the organization really is best known for our flagship event, uh, which is a two-week uh, multicultural festival that takes place every August. We always kick off on the August long weekend, uh, mm -hmm. running for 14 days. We have uh, about half of our 40 plus pavilions that run one week and then they flip and, and we have another uh, 20 or so uh, that run the second week. And um, we are actually uh, the longest, um, world's largest and longest running multicultural festival of its kind uh, right here in Little Winnipeg. So oh, that's um, awesome. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah, so that's what we're best known for. Um, and then on a year-round basis, we have, um, you know, a ethnocultural arts division where we have um, all of our ethnocultural artists, performers who you see at the festival, as well as many others who are solo artists uh, that actually uh, perform um, year-round, both for celebration of culture, but also for uh, education. So uh, we have, you know, a teaching program, talent program, and um, yeah, we're, we're a 365-day operation. Oh, that's awesome. That's amazing. So you mentioned longest running. So mm -hmm. when was it established and how has it evolved over the years? Well, it's um, actually the, the Folk Art Council of Winnipeg, um, as we're, we're, we're commonly known. Um, <laughs> those conversations began way back in the mid 60s. Uh, for a group of um, individuals who were looking to establish a, a core nucleus of, um, you know, the different cultures uh, in our Manitoba fabric. And uh, the first actual festival took place in 1970. Uh, so that was actually supposed to be in celebration of Manitoba's centennial. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was so popular. Uh, it continued, of course. Here we are uh, over 50 <laughs> years later. Um, it... Uh, it was humble beginnings. You know, there was, I believe, 21 uh, mm -hmm. communities, civilians that took place that first year, and there were 90,000 visits. And um, in our last festival in 2019, we had 43 pavilions and uh, recorded 455,000 visits. So, uh, yeah, the evolution is, is, um, yeah. is, is amazing. I guess just another aspect is just thinking about how, like, technology kind of ties into festivals in, in the modern day. Like back in the 70s, it didn't have the internet yet. You just had kind of like radio and newspaper and television. 
but yeah, you didn't have social media and all those things. So that's probably changed things a, a lot as well. Absolutely. I mean, you know, we're, we're able, obviously, to uh, speak to a different demographic than we would usually uh, hit. Mm-hmm. Uh, If it wasn't for social media, that's definitely been um, one of the great things about that. Um, But we're also, um, you know, able to, well, we haven't had to stream before, but uh, (laughs) now we're able to provide a lot of our programming and, um, you know, workshops that we're developing um, online, which is something that I guess is one of the silver linings of COVID. It kind of, you know, pivoted us into that direction. Um, So that's fantastic because we're able to reach um, audiences that, uh, normally attend a festival or, you know, even those that are international that uh, don't usually have that opportunity. So yeah, technology is, is great. Absolutely. Fantastic. And we'll probably get into a little bit more about that in terms of the streaming in just a bit, but uh, yeah, talking about, you know, how things have happened over the past almost two, <laughs> two ish years. Uh, you know, what were some of the challenges uh, the festival faced during the pandemic? Well, um, coming off of 2019, which was our 50th and which was just a year of celebration, um, you know, we literally went from one of our highest attendances in in recent years to um, there's absolutely no way that a major event is going to happen. So that was it was very surreal, um, you know, because no matter what we do business wise, the festival is still um, the number one. Um, revenue generator for the organization and all of a sudden we weren't going to have it and there wasn't going to be any cash flow and um, you know we uh, and we didn't know for how long that would happen so we you know we had to cut down our team Um, we had to figure out how we were going to keep the doors open just as far as from you know an organizational perspective and um, then we also had to reimagine some of our programming So if we weren't able to have people come to the festival, um, how do we have the festival go to people, um, you know, in a smaller scale? So um, out of that came some great um, at home, at work, at school programs last year, where we took a mini festival experience and and brought it into people's backyards and did it, you know, within the COVID parameters. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, um, you know, we went through the, the, the shock and awe of what we were facing, I think, like many people did. And then it was, um, the creativity and the reimagining of, of things to get through the year. Mm-hmm. So what do you think was kind of learned during the pandemic in terms of skills and, you know, organization within uh, the, you know, the festival? And, you know, what do you think how, or how do you think those skills will help, you know, benefit the festival and Folklorama moving forward? Well, when it comes to the festival itself, um, you know, we really are the conduit to oversee and support the operations of our pavilions. It's truly our volunteers who are the operational force. Um, and I have to give credit where credit is due. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see where what the festival looks like going forward as far as uh, expectations of the public and everything else. Mm-hmm. There's still a lot of discussions to be had and skills to be learned. Um, I would say as an organization, we definitely uh, learned how valuable our ethnocultural arts division is. Um, something that we've always we've always seen the value in but I think Mm -hmm. the public has seen more value in um, and become more aware of and um, you know also just uh, the talent of our the team that surrounds us and um, the flexibility of people to do what needs to be do you know have it done rather and having that passion for the organization and and being able to do whatever we needed to do um, whether it was in the job description or not um, (laughs) to be able to to execute um, and keep you know, culture alive and programma alive in people's minds over the last year and a half. Of course, like we always want to like celebrate, you know, the diverse cultures uh, here in Canada. And, you know, festivals like this, not only do they, you know, bring money into the community through tourism or just like people coming in for the festival for a day, you know, it just, it, it helps build community. It, absolutely. Um, absolutely. And, and that's one of the things, you know, about Manitoba is, um, you know, we are such a multicultural community, and um, I have no doubt that Folkorama's um, legacy is, is truly having kept that 
community vibes, those communities vibrant. Uh, many communities really, it's their anchor, right? Um, they they may not see each other all year, but they're going to come together for, you know, mm -hmm. six months of the year to start working towards the civilian and the planning, and it just becomes second nature. Um, you know, and, and others are very active all year round. They're, they're you know, they're <laughs> all very different. But um, it's definitely uh, one of the things I heard the most, you know, wasn't even about the lack of revenue for a lot of the communities, although that exists, yeah. but it was um, just, you know, that coming together of people that they missed. So, mm -hmm. um, no, uh, de definitely we're so much more than just a festival for sure. We are community. Awesome. So what can people expect to see this year? Well, we, um, we're, you know, we, our plans have changed consistently uh, through the last few months based on uh, the ever-changing public health restrictions. And we were hoping we were going to be able to do something in person this summer, mm -hmm. um, you know, even on a different scale, but quickly discovered that it wasn't possible with uh, the third wave hitting us hard. So again, our team uh, got together and, and uh, reimagined and we are uh, launching Filgram Effusion. Uh, it's a virtual event, which will actually Ooh. stream live from Burton Cummings, uh, which is something that we've never done uh, over three nights. So uh, Friday, August 6th to Sunday, August 8th. And each day will feature a different region. So first night will be Asia, Africa. Second night is the Americas. And third night is uh, Europe. And um, really cool. Um, you know, we have 23 of our uh, communities actually uh, able to participate, mm -hmm. um, which is fantastic. Um, you know, it, it's been hard because not everybody's been able to practice or, you know, figure out how, how, to, how to get together or felt safe in coming together. But um, we have a, a good core group that we're going to be able to um, display over that weekend. And um, it's actually being tied into our first ever virtual marketplace. Um, and virtual uh, ethnocultural food week. Uh, the food is extremely important at Folklorama, as everybody knows. Um, so, you know, we, we have a lot of different partners and local restaurants around the city who are joining so that you can, um, you know, order from them during the week leading up to the event. And then, of course, um, to pair your meal while watching the show. Of course, you can't have a cultural festival without the food. Absolutely not. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So you mentioned earlier in our conversation, pavilions, and you've mentioned a couple of times. Mm -hmm. What exactly is a pavilion? So a pavilion is actually um, a one of our ethnocultural communities um, okay. that decides they want to participate. And then within the pavilion, uh, they organize their own operations team uh, where they produce uh, a show a few times a night based on some set show time. Uh, there's culturally appropriate uh, food and, and specific beverages that sometimes people can only get once a year, um, as well as usually a little mini marketplace. So they can either buy souvenirs uh, from that region or they have other local vendors. Um, and um, our population, our, our public, uh, basically plan their night out. Um, Pavilion, we, we organize the festival so that there's a minimum of three shows a night. And uh, people will typically organize their, their evenings so that they're able to pavilion hop. Uh, it's like what we like to call it, uh, you know, based on pavilions that are, are located in the same area. Uh, they're throughout the city. So um, sometimes they're at actual organiza members' organizations. Um, other times they're in a school or a rented venue. Um, so it's basically the home to that ethnocultural community for the week where they show, they welcome you and they showcase all of their talent, food, um, and mm -hmm. So this isn't, they're all not congested in one location. This is spread out across all of Winnipeg. It is. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you, because we flip uh, weeks, there's about half of them, right? So about 20 or so, uh, one week, and then they flip uh, to the next, the other pavilion. Some of them are in the same spot. Some of our communities get together and they, they share uh, a location. Mm -hmm. uh, and others, like I mentioned, have their own organizations and, um, you know, they're able to do it solo. So it actually gives people a really good chance to reacquaint themselves with the city, sometimes even go to places, you know, that they yeah, just don't been. generally go to. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, yeah, so we're really looking forward to uh, that being able to happen again in, in 2022. Um, <laughs> you know, you know, but for this year, it's really going to be a pavilion hopping through, uh, through the, the few evenings that we have the virtual event. The virtual event, fantastic. Um, so like you mentioned, the hope is 2022, we can finally have these large in-person festivals. 
uh, again, for communities that, you know, want to participate, how do they go about that? Well, uh, Folkram is actually a member, member-based member organization. So uh, the first step to that is uh, to inquire with us about becoming a member. And uh, once your membership is approved, then we talk to you about what you want to do. If you want to have a pavilion, then we set you up uh, for best success by um, or having a community shadow with another community for a mm-hmm. year uh, prior to applying for a license, just to make sure that they, they know everything that's involved. Um, it's a, a, a huge task uh, to operate a pavilion. Uh, so we want to make sure that people um, know what they're getting into. Um, so uh, they would shadow for a year and then they would have, um, then they would put together an application uh, and submit their business plan with respect to how they're going to execute things. So it's about a two year process between wanting to be a pavilion and actually having a pavilion. Mm-hmm. If someone doesn't want to, you know, ha- have a pavilion or like perform or have anything like that, are there other ways people can get involved in helping the uh, festival folklorama, uh, you know, succeed and be the best it can be in the community? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, membership, of course, is always an option. That's just if you want to network and, and keep in touch mm-hmm. with all the things we're doing. Um, but if not, uh, you know, when it uh, we do have volunteer opportunities um, on a year-round basis and uh, then of course when we do have a typical festival year and uh, we have special events and uh, bus tours and, and a whole bunch of other different opportunities uh, as well as the pavilions themselves sometimes needing help recruiting volunteers um, mm-hmm. there's always an opportunity for that uh, but the best thing i'd say is to um, you know it's for uh, sign up for our newsletter, um, our e-newsletter through fulcrama.ca, uh, just to keep up to date on all the great happenings because um, mm-hmm. there's a lot that, that does go on during the year. So um, that's probably the best way to stay involved and in touch. Fantastic. And just kind of to to wrap things up, um, I hope I remember the name correctly, Folklorama Fusion, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. So when does Folklorama Fusion take place this year? And where can people find out more information about Folklorama? Uh, so it's uh, August 6th through 8th. And uh, the easiest way to do it is to go through our website, folklorama.ca. There's a whole festival section um, dedicated to schedule, access opportunities, and everything else that you can find there. Fantastic. Is there anything else you'd like to share, Teresa? Just that we are excited uh, to be top of mind this year and still involved somehow in the community. And uh, we're missing the public and we're missing our our civilians. And we can't wait to get back to uh, a normal festival uh, in the coming year. (laughs) If you have any stories you'd like us to share or communities we should highlight, leave a comment down below and make sure you subscribe to stay up to date with everything you multicultural is doing. I'm Ryan Funk, this was You Talk, and have yourself a good one.